guys. So if you guys can put your Penn State email into the chat box for me, that would be awesome. And we're going to just start here for chapter eight. And this is, um, we're starting with inferences for one sample. So remember I talked about before, it's really important that you guys get a good grasp on um, hypothesis testing and what it, you know, hypothesis test is and whatnot, because we're going to be building upon that basis now. So if you remember, these are the five steps for a hypothesis test. Okay, you first have to check your assumptions, write them, calculate your test statistic. And those are the two that we're going to focus on for this lesson for each of the different um, procedures, because the last three are basically always the same. Um, you're always going to determine your p-value, always make a decision off that p-value, and then state that conclusion. You know, that that's the biggest idea there, because um, the first two are going to vary depending on the um, test you're doing, because the assumptions that have to be met and the hypotheses that you write are going to be different, and then the test statistic is different depending on if it's a one sample, two sample, a mean, proportion, so on and so forth. So, but these are the basis, the five that we have as basis, so just keep that in mind. So we are gonna start here with the one sample proportion. And in order to do that, um, we're talking about assumptions have to be met. So we're gonna start with the rule of sample proportion. So it's basically saying that, you know, if we don't have, um, if we're trying to figure out if we can use our sample to estimate our um, population, because remember, that's always what we're doing. We, don't, we can't get all the population, so we wanna estimate using our sample. But rule of sample proportions is basically saying, are we able to do this or not? So um, what we do here in order for this to be met is that, um, n times p has to be at least 10, and then n times 1 minus p has to be at least 10. And if this is true, then you are able to do the rule, or you're able to do a hypothesis test. Um, and then, and once again, also, if these are true, then um, that means that your mean of p hat, so your sample mean, is a, about equal to your population proportion. Or, excuse, so yeah, and we use average mean interchangeably, but remember, you know, proportions are for categorical variables. And then this is the equation for your standard error of a um, proportion. And so, yeah, if these things are true, uh, then your mean is standard deviation. These are the equations you use for them. Okay, and then also I talked about before um, when we do confidence intervals, that was something you want to make sure you have a grasp on so that we can use it now and move forward with it. Um, so our, for our confidence intervals for a proportion, we want to decide which method we're going to use. So the normal approximation method is what we've been doing all along. Now we're just kind of putting a name to it. So it's basically saying we're using the, um, the normal curve, assuming that it is normal, and then we're able to find it um, because remember, this is based upon our p-value. So, I mean, excuse me, on our empirical rule. Um, so remember, p-hat is our point estimate. It's our sample proportion. Z-star is going to be our multiplier, and then here's our standard error here, um, which is our standard deviation of the sample proportion. So this is just a review, but now we're just kind of putting a name to what we've been doing for finding confidence intervals, um, but it is called the normal approximation method. And then this is something that, um, you know, the more and more you do these problems, you'll kind of just memorize these, but these are basically your different confidence levels that you're going to have. Um, and the Z-star multiplier that often goes with them, we're very familiar with the 0.95 and the 95% um, that we usually use the Z-star multiplier of two. Um, and these are just some other common ones that we use. Um, maybe just have like a sticky note of these so that you can quickly refer to them um, if you if it says, you know, find a 90% confidence interval, so you can easily just, you know, put in that Z-star multiplier there that you have. Um, so those are just for your reference. And remember, these are all based upon the, um, upon the empirical rule um, as a review. Okay, so after we go through and, you know, this is where, so the rule of sample proportions is kind of how we estimate this um, that's what the assumptions that we have to check um, for a hypothesis test for a proportion. So um, that's what this number one is, checking those assumptions based upon the role of sample proportions. So our successes and failures have to be at least 10. Um, that's what this translates to. So sample size times probability, or excuse me, sample size times proportion, and then sample size times one minus proportion. So they both have to be at least 10. And then if they are, we can go ahead and write our null and alternative hypotheses. Um, and once again, this is a review of the fact that the uh, null hypothesis is always going to have an equal sign, and the alternative will never have an equal sign. And, you know, I won't go through each of these boxes, obviously. Um, these are things that I think would be beneficial um, if you go back and watch the YouTube video. Um, if you're watching it now, though, you know, go ahead and pause and then, you know, go through this chart and make sure you understand what each part is um, talking about, you know, why they are the way they, that they are. Remember, we do use P um, when we're writing hypotheses, not P hat, um, because we're talking about the population in our hypotheses. 
Um, so I have this chart on all of our um, different hypothesis tests. And like I said, I'm not going to read through each one, um, but it's a good way to kind of, you know, deviate and look through, you know, what the different, how you would write the hypothesis based upon um, the generalized research question there. Okay, and then a test statistic, um, like I said, the second part of the hypothesis test is always going to be the same, or is always going to be a little bit different for each, um, if we're talking about proportion, one proportion, two means, whatever. Um, so Z is our test statistic, and we're going to calculate that um, in this way, the P hat minus um, P subscript zero, so that's our null P, and then divided by our standard error of null P. Um, so remember, that's our uh, population, and then P hat is our sample. So, and you guys have been doing this too. This is our, um, this is the same equation we use to find this, uh, the z-score in general. So that's the one that we also do use for proportions. Um, and yeah, so like I said, I'm gonna go through each um, hypothesis test for each different type of test, and we'll go over the first two steps because remember the last three are always the same, find the p-value and make a conclusion, or make a decision and then make a conclusion about it. So for um, hypothesis testing for one mean, uh, we talked about role sample proportions for one proportion. Now we'll talk about the central limit theorem, which is for one mean. So it's basically saying, when can the sampling distribution for mu be estimated using a normal distribution? Same idea here, basically saying, when can we use our sample to make um, an estimate, but just use our normal distribution? And basically, and we'll talk about later, you know, that it will, like our threshold is basically, n has to be at least 30, and if it is, then we're gonna say that um, it's approximately normally distributed. Because remember, we always talk about we wanna have a large enough sample size, and in this case, um, you know, statistics, we've decided that a large enough sample size is considered at least 30. And then um, even if the population is skewed, if we do have a sample size of at least 30, we can say that we can use this um, based upon the central limit theorem. And then, like we talked about in the last one, remember we said like our mean was, um, n times p, that kind of thing. This one is just mean is mu, and then this is our equation for a standard deviation when we're talking about means. So that's our sample st standard deviate, or excuse me, population standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size there. Um, so if the central limit theorem, all it's saying is that if you have n is at least 30, you're able to use your um, sample mean to be approximately equal to your population mean, and then your standard deviation is gonna be this equation right here. All right, and then the same thing like we were talking about, confidence intervals again for means. Um, so this is like we uh, like the normal approximation method for um, proportions. This one's gonna be for means. You have your point estimate plus or minus a multiplier times your standard error, which is, this is always our, um, that's our general equation that I just wrote above, but this is the specific one for when we have a confidence interval for a single population mean. We do have our sample mean right here, the X bar plus or minus T star, which is a little bit different. Um, so our multiplier for means is gonna be T star and then times our standard error of um, the, so that's your sample standard deviation, the S, and then um, divide by your square root of N. So remember, that's your standard error. So same idea, um, point estimate, multiplier, standard error, like we've been doing all along. Now we're just putting some context to it. Okay, and then, okay, yeah, this is just how to find the, the um, necessary sample size when we're estimating a population mean. Um, if you guys were, here during any of the re reviews um, or Q&As, we talked a lot about how, you know, this equation is just kind of conceptual. You won't ever really have to go through this and, um, and you know, solve it out. Um, you know, you could practice doing it, but, you know, it's definitely something that, you know, you often are able to find, you know, by a paper or, excuse me, like on Minitab or something. So I would practice it more so on there, um, but this is another way to do it. Um, but I won't go through it just because it's it's not as common um, for you guys and you won't really need it on exams. Um, okay, and then so hypothesis testing for a mean is gonna be, so number one, you wanna check any of the necessary assumptions as always. So first we wanna make sure if we're talking about means and our data has to be quantitative and then they also have to be randomly sampled from a population that's normally, approximately normally distributed and and then basically if it's normally distributed, that's another thing with the central limit theorem. It says that, you know, even if it is, if the population skewed, but then you can still assume that that's normally distributed if you have a sample size of at least 30. Um, so yeah, then let's see. So yeah, once again, this is just a table that I have here with your research question and then the, the three different, um, you know, the three different research questions you can have and then what your null and alternative hypothesis would be. And then, um, 
so yeah, those are the, that's the first step for hypothesis testing for a mean. And then paired means, um, we're moving on a little bit to that, is this, it's, we're talking about confidence intervals again. And the only difference for this one is, um, the only difference for this one is that your, uh, your sample, or excuse me, your point estimate has a subscript D. Um, so that means that's the difference of means. And then T star, remember that's our, um, what we use for means or multiplier, and then times your standard error here. And then a note here, T star is a multiplier, and then your degrees of freedom are N minus one. We'll start to see that a lot um, with degrees of freedom. So uh, start to keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, so same uh, general equation, always have that point estimate plus or minus your multiplier times your standard error. Um, and then for the difference in two means, it's the same one as uh, same equation as for one mean, except you have this subscript D for your standard um, sample standard deviation and sample mean, um, just to show that it is going to be the difference between those two means. So you're going to have two means, but by finding the difference and subtracting them, you go ahead and get this um, one value, which is the difference between the two there. And then when we're doing a hypothesis test for these means, you want to just make sure that you go ahead and check all the assumptions first once again. And remember, we did talk about, obviously, they have to be quantitative, um, like we talked about in the last one for means. But um, for this one, they do have to be paired. So if they're paired, then we know that um, we can, this is when we're talking about for um, paired means. That means that they're going to be dependent on one, one another. And then once again, you know, it has to be at least 30, our sample size. So. So yeah, that's our, and then once again, this table for you guys to check out. Um, it's a good way to check your work and kind of make you understand, you know, what is going on um, in terms of, you know, what, what null and alternative hypothesis should have you written. Um, so this is just a good way to check and kind of understand that conceptually too, and also reinforce the fact that our null hypothesis will always have an equal sign. Alternative will never have an equal sign, and also that we do use mu, what we're talking about when we write our um, hypotheses, because that's our population mean. And same thing with proportions, we use P, not P hat. Okay, and then um, this is just, once again, we talk about um, our test statistics. And so since we're talking about means, we are gonna use T once again, same idea. But, and like I said, same equation that you would use for just normal, like for one mean, however, you do have this subscript of D, uh, <clears throat> excuse me here, then that's gonna be showing you for, um, that's because you have two means together, so you want to show the difference between them and these values. So that's the only difference there. Don't let it get you tripped up. But in order to get this, you are going to be using um, both means that you have paired. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so let's do some reviews because usually these are a bit more helpful to um, apply the information. So which, just a review because p-values are important. Um, which statement is correct about a p-value here? So read through these and let me know what you think the answer is, and then we will go over it together. Okay, good, yeah, so our answer here is gonna be A. So remember, we always, if we're trying to find evidence, we always wanna have a small p-value. So, um, and then remember, our alternative hypothesis is saying that there's, a, um, there's some sort of change going on. Um, so if we have a small p-value, that's gonna be um, stronger evidence in favor of the alternative, which is saying strong, stronger evidence in terms of there being a change. Um, so that's why A is our answer. Um, that's not correct, it's not in favor of the null, because that means no change. Um, and then these two are just kind of saying whatever, but A is the correct answer, so good job. Just good to understand a p-value, because um, we talk about it a lot, but you want to make sure you understand the concept of it. So let's try this one. So based on a 2000 census, 31.8% of grandchildren in California are their primary caregivers for their grandparents. Suppose that N equals 200 people are to be sampled from this population. The sample proportion of grandparents is primary 
caregivers is to be calculated. So um, if you go ahead and find the standard error here, go ahead and try to calculate that and use the role sample proportions as a hint there and then let me know what you guys think. Oh yeah, it's no problem. Let's go over it together then so we can look at the formula. Um, so remember, if we're talking about standard error, we're gonna do our square root of P times one minus P and then divide it by N. So in this case, our P is gonna be 0 0.38, excuse me, 318. And then if we were to go ahead and solve this out, we get 0 0.318 times one minus 0 0.318, and then divide by N, which is 200. So you end up getting this answer here. So does that understand, do you understand how we did the formula there? We used our sample size, um, and then the census, this is how it's our population. Um, so that's why, since it's our population, we're gonna use P, and then that's it. Does that make sense how we solve that one out there? All right, cool, good job. All righty, so this one's just a conceptual one kind of, so given that the average height of an NBA player is 201 centimeters with the standard deviation of eight centimeters, if we were to take a random sample of 30 NBA players, what is the mean of the distribution of sample means? So this is kind of conceptual, so keep that in mind to so try this one out. Okay, yeah, so I mean, you could do this through a formula, but the main idea for this one, remember, is that through our like central limit theorem, um, if we have a sample size that's at least 30, then we can assume that our population, um, so our population mean is about equal to our sample mean. So in this case, we found that the average height um, of NBA, NBA players is 201, so that means our population mean is 201, and then we're trying to find the sample mean but since we have a standard deviation, or excuse me, since we have a sample size of at least 30, we're able to assume that they're approximately the same according to the central limit theorem. So we can say that X bar in this case is also gonna be 201 because this is our population mean, but we're using that in terms of the central limit theorem since our sample size is big enough. Does that make sense? That's what I was saying, it was kind of conceptual. You don't really have to solve anything. It's just kind of understanding the central limit theorem. All right, cool. All right, and all right. So you wanna construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean risk diameter of Penn State World Campus students. A previous study examined the risk diameters of adults and found a sample mean of 10.543 centimeters with a standard deviation of 0.944. What sample size should you use to construct um, with a margin of error of 0.1 centimeters? So go ahead and try this one out.
Okay, yeah, that's totally fine. So what we want to do here, let me just move this out of the way. Okay, so we want to go ahead and remember for 95% confidence interval, we usually use our Z star to be two. And um, so then we have our standard deviation here um, is 0 0.944. And then what else do we have? This is our margin of error. Okay, so um, our equation, we're gonna have our sample size equals Z star and then times our standard deviation. And then divide that by our margin of error. Okay, so what we wanna do here then is just go ahead and plug all that in. So we'll do two times 0 0.944, oh, excuse me, you have to square it, um, 944, and then divide it by 0 0.1, which is our margin of error. And then we go ahead and square this, and then we get about equal to 342.339. So that means that our sample size should be at least 343, which we round up because there's this little bit of excess. Um, and since we're talking about people, we just want to make sure we round up there. So that's our answer. So, so yeah, definitely that's the equation there. And um, obviously you can go back to the uh, YouTube video too to check that out. Okay, so, so yeah, good job guys. Um, like I said, you can go ahead to the YouTube channel, check out more of these. And for this one, our next group review will be next week, um, next Thursday. If you guys have any other questions for me, go ahead and type them into the chat box. If not, you guys are good to go for tonight. Thank you for stopping by. No problem.